seven o'clock, and I will call this meeting of the select board on uh, May 15th to order. First agenda item is to approve the agenda. I have a motion. Motion to approve agenda. Second. Okay, we have a motion to approve and is seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the agenda as warned, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The agenda is approved. <clears throat> Next item is the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda. All right. Second. Uh, the motion is second. Any further discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, all in favor of the consent agenda, please signal by saying aye. Hi. Hi. Do you want to take a moment just to acknowledge Nathan who joined us by Zoom? That was his item. Yeah. Sure. Nathan, welcome and congratulations. Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate it. Nathan is the new owner of the uh, beer cellar uh, on Elm Street. Uh, anything you'd like to further discuss with the board, Nathan? Uh, no, not at this time. Looking forward to getting more involved in the Water Bay community. I'm a local resident myself. Um, bought a home here in, uh, in 2018. So, um, yeah, just an exciting venture for me and my wife and my 16-month-old uh, 16, 16 baby boy. So, uh, we're, we're excited for this new chapter. So, thank you for having me. Well, welcome to the community, belatedly. Uh, and uh, congratulations on your new purchase. Uh, uh, I live right around the corner, so I think I'll uh, stop in soon. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, no, we'll wait for yeah. just for some research. For, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, thanks again for stopping in and congratulations. And uh, your second class liquor license uh, has been approved. Uh, and uh, I heard no, no votes or any absentee votes. Uh, Abstentions? No? Okay, so the consent agenda is approved. All right, now's the time for uh, the public to voice any, uh, bring up any article that is not on the warning agenda. Uh, I request that you uh, try to limit yourself to three minutes uh, and we would be glad to put anything that you have to, that would require more than that on the agenda for the next meeting. Anyone from the public? Chris? First, I want to apologize for showing up to every meeting since <laughs> I just can't sit at home and bury my head in the sand with things that are happening in my community because I quite honestly give a damn too much. Uh -huh. uh, second thing is uh, we talked about the banner at one point. Uh, and I had suggested an open house at the school, uh, a meet and greet with uh, community members. Would still like you to consider that. Anybody that I've mentioned this thought to absolutely thinks it's a spectacular idea. Mm -hmm. uh, second thing is. I still have concern about the homeless and drug problem. Um, I was talking to a person the other day at my chiropractor's office. Apparently the state is doing away with the funding for <coughs> sheltering homeless. June 1st, this particular person went to that meeting and <coughs> In his words, said it was it's going to be a complete shit show, and is personally afraid for his own safety. He lives in Montpelier. Um, I don't know if there's an ordinance in our town that addresses that issue. If there isn't, would the board consider something like that? You know my concern, I've talked to you about it before. I don't want to see Main Street turned into Skid Row. 
and our business has become ruined. And I think following other towns' lead on this will be futile because they're failing miserably in their efforts to combat this problem. So that's it. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, the uh, conservation uh, committee did uh, host that uh, program that you uh, participated in uh, to uh, get uh, people's uh, ideas on what they prioritized uh, and what they valued in the community, which I think was an effort to do something along what you uh, were suggesting in terms of meet and greet. Um, but uh, did you have any particular day or idea in mind in terms of staging that thing at the school? No, I think it's, you know, I know it's not on the top of your priority list, but I'm telling you, I've talked to a lot of people about it. Mm -hmm. Everybody feels disconnected from their neighbors in this community. And I told you before, every day I wake up, people, I just had a friend of mine two weeks ago Friday pass away. Um, I was able, he was able to, speaking from the conservation part of it, he's got 18 acres right there at the top of Loomis Hill where Loomis and Ripley and Sweet Road all come together. It's got, uh -huh. got the two horses there in the field. Mm -hmm. I was executor. He asked me to be executor, which blew me away. But anyway, through that paperwork, we managed to put in the deed that that property will never be subdivided. Huh. And only one house can be on That was his will. Cool. But anyway, um, the people that I know and grew up with are leaving or dying. And the met people that are moving in here, a lot of us are unfamiliar with. Uh, there's people today that I'm working for on uh, Thurston Road that uh, they're starting a new house in the field. Um, I think I think it's kind of funny that you'd be surprised how many people you would know that you don't know that are living real close to you if you were if you had the chance to be introduced to them. Yeah. And I guess that's all. It doesn't. It, it, it politics doesn't have to be any part of this. Mm -hmm. For me, it's this. It's the problem of perception about people. I mean, I was, in my opinion, sorely mistreated under that pretense because people didn't really know who I was. Yeah. And I guess that's what sunk into me so bad that I think across this country, the, the uh, discourse and hatred toward each other is simply because you don't know each other. Yeah. You, don't have to, you don't have to agree with them. But to know who they are and get a little bit of understanding about who your neighbor is, I think would help this community immensely. Yep, I agree with you. Okay, um, let's uh, let's see what we can do. Let's see if we can set something up, and uh, I'll be back in touch with you on that. On the homeless thing, uh, was something that I talked over with Tom because uh, we have noticed a couple of new people in town. Um, uh, I don't know if we have a solution quite yet, and uh, even if we did, we have, it's not on the agenda to, to discuss it. Uh, but uh, it is something that uh, I'm concerned about, and I'm sure the rest of the board is too. So we'll continue. I don't know, Tom, if you have anything to, to mention on that. I just want to say, Chris, we appreciate your involvement. involvement. I think there, if there were more people like yourself, it came to board meetings and stuff and participated. I think it would, it would help foster dialogues, plus, you know, even foster than what you're talking about. We would have a meet and greet, you know, on a much smaller level by people showing up. And I know it's a it's a hard sell to do, but you got to try. Um. I don't have a whole lot of thoughts on the homeless issue. If there was a solution, we would have found it. Um, I guess I think more about unintended consequences. If the town passed an ordinance banning, I think sometimes these ordinances are called camping. 
um, then are these people worse off as a result? They might, you know, we, we might not want them in our downtown or we might not want the encampment over there, but I, I think the encampment kind of by the interchange is an ideal place. It's not highly visible. The state police keep tabs on them. Um, I have yet to get a complaint about it in terms of any public safety concern. People, I think, are, there's some heightened awareness of it because I think they've, it's either gotten bigger or they've moved it, so it's a little more visible from the road now. Um, even in my small car, I can now see it. Um, and yeah, according to you know the data, that 2,500 people will be homeless in a few months, and you know, for one percent of the state's population, that's 25 people yeah. in Waterbury. Um, I'm also not certain that that's going to happen, and the state's going to. Mm -hmm. The state lawmakers have allowed that to happen. Um, it, it appears certain to me that you know a good chunk of that will happen. It sounds like regardless, you know, five hundred to a thousand people are going to be homeless soon enough. Um, I guess what I would suggest is if you're trying to do right by these people, you probably want to find a way to, to house them and pay for it as a town. But that's a hugely expensive proposition. Well, that's we don't have a shelter. We probably don't have an available building. That's okay. So that's my concern uh, is to not try to deal with this up front. We're talking about a handful of homeless right now, but there is the potential for that to become unmanageable with numbers. Uh, and then to try to put the bill and solve that problem. Unfortunately, society tends to focus on the consequence of the problem instead of the cause, instead of going to the cause and preventing that from happening. They continue to throw money at the consequence and get nowhere other than in, in deeply in debt. Okay. Tom, do you know if the governor signed that change to Act 250 this morning? I do not. I know it was, I know it was before his desk. That would allow for acreage to be opened up for multiple houses, which would hopefully move along our housing problem and in doing so, ease up on the homelessness problem as well. Well, they spent millions of dollars subsidizing these hotels to put these people in. And if you have taken that money and funneled it into actual construction and housing, that would have been permanent instead of a subsidy running out that now puts some people out on the street. Uh, misguided money. Mm -hmm. was the yes, then. Just really briefly, I met last year or even maybe the year before with somebody from Montpelier. Um, and I cannot remember if I sent along his information to you or if it was Bill at the time. So I'm going to look in my email and I'll send it along. But somebody with some really good resources um, so that whether it's us or folks in town know maybe who to call so that we're not just like calling the state police and creating bigger and further deeper issues. So I'll forward that along to both the board and to you. Um, and then that's also somebody who was willing to meet and chat, willing to come with, to talk to the housing task force as well um, to help us with some brainstorming and some both short-term and long-term planning. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a good discussion, but I don't think we're here today to be able to come up with a solution. I, I think we do need to have an agenda at some point in the near future, an agenda item uh, to discuss, you know, what we can, can and cannot do and maybe do some research in advance. But now it's just, like we're, we're just poking at things. Uh, Karen, maybe we can put that in the parking lot. We'll do. Yeah. Do. All right, any further discussion from the public? All right, so we'll move on to the next item. Library strategic plan. Yes, please. Uh, I don't know exactly how we're going to do it. Yeah, you can stick it in the ball. There you go. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I know we've had to delay multiple times due to <laughs> family issues. Mm, yes, yeah, I'm dealing with. Um, 
But I just wanted to take this opportunity to uh, update folks on the library strategic plan. So we did approve a strategic plan for the library uh, at the beginning of this year. And a number of you were involved in conversations of, as we were developing that plan. Um, I think everybody has probably seen some of the strategic plan information. Um, and it's the full plan is available on our website if you'd like to read through that. It's pretty long. Um, so the major takeaways from the plan were that uh, we, we found that there are a lot of people in the community who are very aware of the traditional library services, but didn't know so much about some of the other services that we offer, uh, such as one-on-one uh, -on -one tech help and things like that. So we want to make an effort to do more promotion, raise awareness. Uh, we do want to reach out to underserved communities and find new ways to meet their needs. Uh, this includes newcomers to the United States, uh, homebound people, and, and yes, unhoused people who are uh, major library users. So uh, that's an area that, <laughs> that I see a lot of. Um, and we do want to ensure that the library is a safe and welcoming space for all of those people. Uh, it's a wide range of individuals that we serve, uh, but I think we do a pretty good job balancing everybody's needs. Um, and part of that is to review policies and collections to match the interests of the community and provide offerings for everybody who might need those. Uh, so how are we doing? We're doing great, actually. I'm really pleased with what we're doing. Uh, we've been able to add some hours to our youth librarian position and rearrange the schedule for our outreach coordinator position so that they both have a little bit more time to get out of the building and do outreach at uh, events in the community. Um, I've been encouraging and funding staff attendance at professional development programs. Uh, and it's been going really well. Most interesting, our youth librarian was invited to present at the Library Journal slash School Library Journal Youth Leadership Summit in Florida on the success of her Queer Reads program, uh, which has been providing a very uh, welcoming and safe space for kids in the community who uh, are, you know, maybe struggling with uh, their identity or figuring out how they can talk about those things in a safe way. Um, we've expanded services to homebound patrons. We've got a much more organized book delivery system in place now. Uh, we've partnered with the Senior Center to get promotional materials out to uh, folks who are Meals on Wheels customers, uh, because that seems like a natural <laughs> audience for us. Um, we've been refreshing and expanding promotion of some of our underutilized services, such as uh, the book delivery, tech one-on-one -on -one help, and partnerships with community organizations. We've been doing more food drives, more uh, supplies drives, uh, providing supplies to folks who may not have access to them uh, through, part and we aren't paying for any of those. Those are all things that, uh, that we're getting through donation, which is wonderful. Um, we've been reviewing and updating policies with an eye towards diversity and inclusion. Uh, so far, we've completed just one policy. We've got a long way to go on that, but it's, it's good work that's underway. Uh, and we've been training all staff in how to work with a diverse and sometimes challenging community. Major training that's going to happen on May 25th is uh, a full day mental health first aid training, because sometimes we do run into patrons who uh, clearly are experiencing mental health challenges, and I want my staff to feel a little bit more comfortable when they're facing those types of issues. Updating some staff technology to make um, communication smoother and expanding our Spanish language uh, book collection. And we received a really nice thank you note from a social worker who works with um, a family that's new to the community that speaks Spanish, who has been very impressed with what we've done to be welcoming to that, that community. Uh, so that's where we are right now. Next steps are gonna be to assess our hours to make sure that we are best serving our community uh, and also balancing our staff capabilities because we wanna make sure staff don't get burned out if you add additional hours. Uh, we're going to continue to update and review those policies um, through a DEI lens, particularly around um, material selection, so the actual books and materials that we purchase for the library, and use of the library, behavior expectations, things like that. Uh, and we're going to continue to identify and promote those underutilized services in fresh ways. I'm looking for interns, volunteers with some marketing skills to help us out with that, because that's not an area that librarians typically get a lot of training in. So if I can find people who are who have that, that passion and that skill set, that would be wonderful. Eventually, we'd like to uh, develop a marketing plan. So that's where we are. That's my very quick update on the library strategic plan, but I'd be happy to, to answer any questions. Are you actively currently looking for a marketing and social media intern or not quite yet? We we brought a student in from Bennington College last summer. It didn't work out quite as I'd hoped. So we're, we are, once we get the other challenge, we, we have been dealing with some staff turnover. So once I'm back up and staffed again, I'll be more actively looking for people in that area. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have a rep program do a lot more 
marketing, oh. digital marketing, if you have social media, mm -hmm. get active there. Maybe we could work together and instead of everybody kind of doing their own separate thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about your um, working with the with the Spanish speaking folks. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you going about doing? That? Well, what we discovered was there are so the library becomes a space that people use for meetings a lot of the time and. Um, we discovered there were a couple of families that were coming in to meet with um, community organizers or social workers or uh, groups like that. So it gave us an opportunity to kind of ask what their needs were. So we just started purchasing some books. We made a nice display of Spanish language uh, picture books alongside their uh, uh, English language counterparts, which was really nice. And um, we tried to incorporate a little bit of Spanish speaking into some of our story times. Uh, what we found uh, has been really wonderful is just like how many people in the community, once they discover there are, there are Spanish speaking, speak, speaking families at story time know Spanish themselves and we'll start talking to them. So it's been able to kind of organically allow for some communication within the community. So we sometimes just, uh, because we're a space where people are coming to meet, we can kind of feel like like with, with unhoused people and, and people like that, we can kind of feel out, oh, there's some needs in the community around this area. So we can put some energy into it. That's great. Thank you. You mentioned um, an intern that you were looking at in Bennington College. Would that be like a summer type? Because you, yep. you know the distance. Well, yeah, we had a, a Bennington student um, actually during the winter kind of in between session, um, and she lived in Stowe. So she okay. was she was home for the so she was home for the winter. So she was able to come, come down to the library from okay. Stowe. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, we don't have a really natural school to draw interns from, so <laughs> everything's a little bit too far away. Uh, so we, we have to get lucky occasionally and find someone who happens to be in the area. You think UVM? UVM is not that far. Away. It's not that far away. Maybe I can encourage them to come out to Waterbury. Yeah. Do you have any role with those little libraries uh, that we see set we, up in our neighborhoods? It, we really don't. It's mm -hmm. just uh, that's that's a volunteer funded effort. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I we have a, a small book sale in our library, and that's kind of what we do with our old books or books that have been donated to us. Um, but if anybody ever wants old books to stock a little free library, we're always very happy to provide them because we always have a lot of older books on hand that we can we can provide to something like that. Mm -hmm. I just want to say I think you do a great job and I think we have a great library. Oh, thank you. It's it's a it is a great library. I think that Waterbury is lucky to have it, but Waterbury supports it so well. So that it's exciting too. to see some of the ideas for the future. I know, like I mean, I used to just check out books, but I had no idea that some of the other services, even like the discounts for museums. Okay. And I've been telling all my friends who are parents, I'm like, you're missing out on like really cool stuff. So. Yeah. I look forward, that's why I was asking about the intern, I look forward to being able to really spread the word. Yeah, that's what we really found when we would when we were doing interviews for the strategic plan and people would say, oh, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And we, we already did all these yeah. things. People just didn't know it. So now we're going to make more of an effort to make sure people know it's not just books. You know, there's a lot of other things you can do. Too. Some with young kids who does a lot of road trips with the, the Liddy program. Oh, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How is your, I know the telescope Mm -hmm. project and I know I think you also lend these snowshoes I don't know mm -hmm. if you do skis as well snowshoes a telescope uh board games puzzles cooking supplies uh all kinds of things Those are all watershed well. exploration kits yeah we, it's a it's a we have a lot of library of things items um that again people don't always know about so people don't think <laughs> yeah. of the library so right yeah, yeah. they just gotta know yeah so Did you say watershed exploration yeah it's <laughs> okay. it's a watershed exploration kit that was uh i forget now what organization donated those but it's like a backpack with like a a, a fishnet and all kinds of things oh, to do so little cool. science experiments <laughs> with water <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. thank you well great work thank you, you. Thank you. I'm going to run back to the library now. We're still open. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next up, we have the discussion and vote related to a new fire truck. Is Gary Dillon come on board? I'm going to stand sitting at the head. <laughs> 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 you don't be that inspired for all hours. Yeah. Oh. 
All the power in my department lies within people, not me. Yeah, you got it. Um, so I guess I want to talk about the tank trucks, and there was, a, I guess, a request about information on the age of the other trucks. Um, so I, going back a couple of years, the, well, back a number of years, actually, um, we had two tank trucks and within a few years, two engines that were purchased at the same time back when we were two separate departments. We used to be a village department and we used to be a town department. And we found that purchasing two at a time, even though that the town paid for theirs and the village paid for theirs and the village paid for one third of the towns, um, it, there was some savings. The village needed an engine, the town needed an engine, and then the village needed a tank truck and the town needed a tank truck. So we're paying the price now uh, for getting those at the same time. Mm -hmm. it, I've been, had been talking with Bill over the last number of years about is there value in keeping them the same because you might see some savings not a lot, but in the past, select board members have said, hey, if we save any money, that's better than not. Um, and then the discussion of, well, why don't we separate them? So starting with the last engines, and it just happened to be that uh, the motor blew on one and the board approved an emergency purchase because we had an option to get uh, a demo truck. And at the same time, the vendor said, hey, I have another demo truck in the wings, kind of on, on the list of going through the process. And uh, back then it was you know, a year and a half to, from the time you order to get the truck. Now it's anywhere two to three years before you can order a truck and get it. Uh, it was such a backlog. Um, <clears throat> So the two tank trucks were due to be replaced in 2021 and 2022. Again, there was discussion about getting them both at the same time. There's a, a little bit of savings when you're dealing with a fire truck manufacturer because they don't have to change anything in the plant when they're running two trucks through. Everything is exactly the same. Um, then the pandemic hit and Bill and I had talked and he asked if we could put it off and see how this pandemic was going to play out. Wasn't sure, you know, people were going to say, hey, I don't have any money, I can't afford this. And that was fine. And we had continued to talk. And before Tom got here, we were still looking at holding off for another couple of years. And then I had the vendor, a vendor call me, same one we bought the last five trucks from. Um, and said, I have one being, it's in line to be built as a demo truck. And if you are interested in that, we can have a discussion about going about that process. So he sent me the information. I met with Tom. <clears throat> the price is phenomenal. Now it's a, it's a demo truck, um, but it's designed for Vermont where he sells most of his apparatus. So it's designed for a hill. What does demo truck do? So typically what he does is he usually has, tries to have on hand an engine or a tank truck. Gotcha. So that when somebody wants to see one, they oh, can. Okay. That's really it. Okay. Um, an example being uh, city of Barry is looking at buying a new engine slash rescue truck and they're looking at the exact same truck that we have that we just recently got a couple of years ago. So we bought his demo trucks. So they came to our station and looked it over and, and identified ways that they could make it fit uh, what they wanted. So uh, we bought his demo trucks and we demoed it for them. Mm -hmm. Nice. So, so the, the tank trucks, again, we, he called me and said, look, I, I have one, it's in the works. It'll be available sometime in the area of 
a, anywhere from April to June of next year. If we held off and, and went through the end of this year and went to town meeting next year to get approval uh, for one tank truck, we wouldn't see that tank truck for probably closer to two years because it's not in line to be built. So I approached Tom. Uh, the price is very good. Um, it's you know a couple hundred thousand less than what we might pay for an engine, um, but there's less to it. Uh, predominantly, it's it, we would use it for on water to a scene where there's no fire items. Um, it does have a pump on it, but sort of on our current ones, this one's just a little bit bigger. Um, it does have a ladder on it. Um, so, you know, it has more updated stuff than a 23 year old, 24 year old truck. Uh, so he said that it's, if we want it, we can sign the agreement. Um, he is, he does know that if at town meeting, the taxpayers say no, he will sell this truck. This, that's not a problem for him to say, okay, you, the town said no, you don't want it. He still gets his demo truck. No harm loss. So I would recommend, uh, you know, it's my job to do that, uh, that you jump on board and at least let the town taxpayers make the decision at town meeting. But if we, but we need to sign the the agreement. Um, I can answer any questions for you. I can answer questions about the other apparatus. I've offered up in the past. I would encourage all of you, not necessarily as an entire board, because then it becomes a public meeting, to just meet me at a fire station and we can go through them and I can explain and show you what each truck does rather than just sitting here in a room. Right. That's kind of my question. I know me and Roger had this conversation. You know, sometimes the nomenclature, you know, gets kind of confusing because, you know, we just purchased two engines, engine trucks. So how this different is a tanker? Correct. Okay, so that's correct. That kind of answers because we were a little unclear as to what we had purchased. The last I understand time. and that's why I would encourage you to right. give me a send me an email give me a call a couple of you at a time one at a time I really don't care sure. uh, my Mondays and Wednesday afternoons are taken up by my granddaughter when I pick her up from school other than that I'm pretty open to meeting day evening it doesn't matter if, if we have a call at three in the morning and you want to come down <laughs> I'm not Going back to bed. So <laughs> I usually hear those. Words. <laughs> so, so there's two here, but it's only one year. It's it's one that we are talking about now. However, he does he is going to be ordering another one, and so you know if you want to save some money, come town meeting day. Maybe you put that out there. You're still only going to get one in 2024. And then one in 2025. So you're not you're not bonding next year for two trucks. You're bonding for one. And that's the uh, three hundred and seventy thousand dollar. Yes. Uh, yes. And what do you do with the one that you're supposed to? Uh, tank trucks are pretty easy to, to sell. Um, the the Midwest and Far West have a lot of brush fires and they buy a lot of tank trucks because they are beat. Um, but we might have a department in Vermont that says, hey, look, we, we don't have much in Vermont. That's what happened with the last two engines. One had a blown motor uh, and the town of Albany, they're, aside from these the 23 year old trucks that they now have that they bought from us, they bought one, we gave them one. Uh, their next newest one is 40 years old. Uh, That's so, not uncommon in rural no. Vermont. Towns with a big tax base or parts of Maine. 
And what's the value of a 22 year old or 23 year old? I, I don't know. You know, you're probably talking an area of 10 to 15,000, somewhere in there. Maybe. They, they do depreciate, but the, the second we take it out on its first call. <laughs> Most fire vehicles, when they're 20, 25 years old, they're, they're at the yeah. end of their life cycle and the value, the residual value is fairly minimal. The only the only departments, as Tom said, that are in the market for old, older trucks like that Real small. are small departments that don't have a lot of money. Um, you know, we, uh, we were going to have to hang on to the one that had a blown motor. It wasn't worth it for us to, to fix it. Um, the mechanic said it was going to be somewhere in the area of $26,000 for a motor and then to replace it. Uh, Albany actually has a garage right on their main strip and the mechanic there had a motor that would go in it and he would wow. give it to them and install it for them. So we didn't have to sit on that truck. For years and we have done that in the past over the years we've sat on trucks until they started rusting so bad that we essentially got rid of them for almost scrap uh, so any other questions for the board uh, uh, uh Alyssa? we got this looks like a document you did with bill way back in 2022 which is giving 230 to 250,000 as a replacement cost i assume that's just inflation that we're looking at oh yes yeah. yeah no just that how was, much stuff has gone up right so that when we did that it was that was based on when we got the truck originally mm -hmm. um it's near impossible to try and guess even the vendors wouldn't say yeah you know, if you buy a truck um, now, I can give you the price. If you wait six months, I can't. Um, and, and, he, yeah. right, and, he, and he is telling you it's 1% a month increase is fairly large. Yeah. yeah. If you're holding off a month, you're okay. If you're holding off a couple of years. Uh, and then who knows? I mean, how long are you going to wait? Uh, Again, there, there are departments that are, have ordered trucks and they're like two years past when they expected to get it. Chris, I think Lisa Scalati's got a question. You know, that's my hand. <laughs> 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 Mike? On a very other note, did you have a successful open house on Saturday? <laughs> it was a good time. I think in about if all of them follow through on their commitment they gave to me in about 10 to 12 years, we got a bunch of firefighters coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they're still in grade school. <laughs> they're still, yes, they're still very young. Um, and, uh, you know, next week, one of them is probably going to want to be Spider Man, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's a great uh, so, so you know it, we did not get any uh adults or or young adults we certainly had a conversation with a couple of young adults we take uh what we call junior firefighters age 16 17 and 18 18 if they're still in high school um and only one kind of fit the mold yet she lives in stuff so mm. they're going to probably get her which is good for the stuff yeah <laughs> yeah okay. still gave me one uh, that we just brought on uh, last week so right now we're at 39 members which is pretty good um what would you consider a full force uh going to a fire and have all the people that i need <laughs> I don't have an answer for that um, because you're not getting everybody at one call. Uh, you know, before the pandemic, we had the higher end of the fifties. Uh, but again, you know, you, during the daytime, sometimes you're not getting that many people. We're very fortunate in Waterbury that we have people that can leave work. One is a little bit slower now because her job moved from Middlesex to Berlin. Um, but uh, 
she, if, if we're going somewhere between the main street station towards Montpelier way, we can throw her gear on the truck and mm -hmm. she can meet us there. So, but again, it's, you know, day times are, are a little bit tougher. Um, and it depends on what the call is. If we had a call the minute I walked out of here and it was a, it was a house fire, we get a lot of people. To the point that if it's just what we call uh, you know, a room and contents fire, it not goes down pretty quick with just what we have. Um, our best mutual aid is Stell, so we get them coming anyways, and they can help us pick up. I just would be remiss if I didn't comment that we're possibly buying a truck from Garth Brooks. Just so well, you know, I received a call from him one time when I was at work, and my phone was sitting on my desk, and it popped up Garth Brooks, and I had that person totally convinced that I was, I knew, and I was friendly with Garth Brooks, and we had to, uh, I had to explain it. It to just tickled me when I saw it. Yeah. Did you wear a black cowboy hat? My childhood even. No, you know, I don't even ever see him wearing a baseball hat. I only wear one when it's either cold or rainy. Or, hot out the sunny. So, um, you know, we don't, we haven't gone out to bid the last few couple trucks. Um, Garth, uh, Brooks, E1, or DeSorcy, um, depending on which one you want to use, uh, he provides a great truck for a really good price. And on top of that, his service is beyond anybody in this area. Um, there are other manufacturers that uh, we have met with prior to just going with him, and you know they, they have a you know a service person in Connecticut or Massachusetts. They got to fit it in. I literally have called him at ten o'clock at night, expecting to get uh, a voicemail, and he answers the phone. And if I asked him to, to send his one of his mechanics down that night, he would. And usually it's if you can make it first thing in the morning, we have. Um, so the service that we get from him is beyond anything else that anybody, any other vendor would get. Or were friends trucks just not in their line that they carry? The, no, these are even ones. So La France is a is a vendor. Um, Pierce is a vendor. Uh, so are they afraid? It, you know. Yeah, so th this is a freight liner, it's a truck, but American of France is a company, right? And you're then it's a historic name, uh, and you would be paying a lot of money for an American of France. Uh, and once they started getting rid of Detroit, <laughs> Detroit diesels, they don't sound as cool as they used to, mm -hmm. but uh, they're, they're just a, a very expensive truck, along with some others that don't do any more than. What we asked from E1. Okay. And Tom, were you able to calculate what the, the anticipated increase would be in the tax rate? To yeah, um, if we finance it for 20 years, it would be a useful life. Yeah. Um, about 26 grand a year, depending on the rates at the time. Every penny on our tax, every $78,000 is a penny on our tax rate, so a third of a penny. So if you have a $300,000 home, every penny increase is another 30 bucks so about ten dollar ten dollars a year increase. for 20 years wow. so but the reason i didn't suggest that we move on both of them is um i don't want to overcommit too far out um, you know we don't something i just sort of put on the back is we don't have reserves to put towards us mm -hmm. so and then we sorry we certainly wouldn't in 2025, so I think each one would get some on the okay. Any other discussion from the board? So motion. Uh, motion to <coughs> to issue issue a bond though. No, 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 just sorry. Issue a purchase order. Issue a purchase order. Was us, uh, pending the approval of the taxpayers on the uh, a town meeting. So right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay. Or with a non appropriation clause was my <laughs> like comment. Oh. This does this document kind of us does not have that. I assume that's pretty pro forma. That was just some baseline. Just so you kind of have the background and the follow up based on this. Okay. 
Tom has the documents. Yeah. And I will check it. <laughs> okay. So, so just to clarify, the, the motion is well said motion. to well, it was crap. <laughs> to issue a purchase order uh, for the uh, E1 freight freight liner um, tanker truck at uh, three hundred seventy thousand uh, dollars, and that would be pending approval of the taxpayers uh, at town meeting uh, in twenty twenty four. I would say to authorize the manager to sign all of that. Mm -hmm. You guys are killing me. <laughs> 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 okay. All right. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Congratulations. Step one. Well, I want to ride it. It's stuck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the coolness wore off a long time ago. <laughs> it was cool during the summer when you rode on the rear step. During the winter, not so cool. Well, actually, well real cool. Yeah, real wow, cool. Too yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Very you so much for all for this. Sure. All right. Next on the agenda, we have the appointment of the animal control officer. Ariel, would you like to come forward? Sure. Yeah, why don't you yeah. come and see the water right over here? I mean, it's very official. It's like being a murderer. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you all for having me here today. Thank you for uh, voicing your interest in the position. Uh, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little bit of background and why you're interested in serving as the uh, animal control officer for Waterbury. Absolutely. Um, I believe you all got a letter of interest or what have you. Um, so as I mentioned in there, I moved to Waterbury in 2019 and moved here for a job with Revitalizing Waterbury. I um, worked with Alyssa over there for a little while. I did leave that in the fall to kind of set out on my own, have a little bit more flexibility in my schedule, which is why something like this would work fairly well with my schedule. Um, I also served as the farmer's market manager for a few seasons, and I am uh, the president of Rotary starting on July 1st, so I have some good community connections, and uh, I'd like to think that I've established myself as you know, trustworthy and hardworking here in town. Um, I love dogs. I have a dog. I love all animals, really, but um, my dogs are very special, I'd say, and mine in particular. Obviously, <laughs> you know, we all think our dogs are the best. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, <I think> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I saw the position and I just kind of thought, you know, I think this is something that I, I could do and that I would enjoy doing. Um, I love to walk my dog around town and I see a lot of dogs around town with that and uh, feel like I have a good handle on some of the situations and issues that kind of arise in line with that. Um, dog leashes, dog leash laws are a big part of that. Um, and that's something that, you know, I would love to try and like increase awareness of that with this position and, you know, ensure that this is a good spot, a good town for people and their dogs and their pets at large and that, you know, everybody can go out, enjoy our recreation, respect each other. Um, you know, along those lines, I also think all animals need a happy, healthy home. So like in the animal welfare of calls, I will take with you know, the, the most serious respect um, to make sure that every every animal has yeah, a safe place, a good family, they're cared for. Um, and yeah, that's what I did. I saw the position and I thought, this sounds like something that I can do and would enjoy doing. So I guess if anyone has any questions for me or wants to discuss anything. Well, there's, yeah, real quick, if there's some of those animal welfare calls are pretty tough. Um, need not expound on that, but I'm happy to be the unofficial deputy for some of those calls on the round. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so my question <coughs> slash comment um, kind of reflects on what Tom just said. Um, here in Waterbury, actually, on my 21st birthday, I was attacked by a pit bull. Um, who uh, severed a nerve in my arm and the dog was improperly dealt with by at the time village police. Um, and then the owner lived in Duxbury. So it was the, the Duxbury animal control officer and then they didn't have an officer. So it kicked back to us. Um, and 
you know, nothing was ever done about it. And then I had heard that that same animal had attacked somebody else. Um, this isn't about that animal. It is about animals like this at large. Um, in the event as the animal control officer that you have an out of control animal with an out of control owner, um, how would you best respond in a situation like that? Yeah, I mean, out of control animal part of it, uh, part of the response would depend on what needs to happen. Does the dog need to be removed from the situation? Does it need to, um, you know, like do you need to try and catch the dog in which case uh, it would have the appropriate tools, muzzles, ways to safely catch the dog and keep myself safe from the dog. Right. Um, as far as, you know, follow up goes, um, for one, I am so sorry that that happened to you and that it was not dealt with properly. It did have a similar situation happen in Walmart where someone was bitten and it was, you know, with no one in the position it never received any follow-up. Um, you know, if it is a problem dog, like there are so many mitigation strategies. It could be training, it could be muzzles, it could be ensuring that that dog is in a place where it can't get out and it can't go after other people. You know, maybe it's totally fine with its people that it's comfortable with and in a new situation, it's not. And there's a lot of different ways from uh, trainings to physical like restraints or tools that can keep that dog safe and away from people. So, you know, you could take a dog out on a walk and even if they have a history of reactivity or biting or things like that, if they're properly muzzled and restrained, then like, that shouldn't be an issue as long as, you know, people are following all those. And um, does that answer your question? Sure, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I guess it was more angled that, you know, <coughs> owners of animals who have tendencies to attack people <coughs> or, you know, get off the leash and, it might not just be jumping over their fence. The, the animal could be brought here from a property in the woods, um, so to speak. Um, so I think my question was more angled at mitigating the animal's uh, handler less than the animal. Yeah. <laughs> so we have an ordinance. We do. Yeah, back in 2015. Uh, it's pretty good, I think. So state law. As reflected in Northern state law, gives the select boards in Vermont a lot of authority to deal with vicious dogs. Um, I think most take the approach that if there's a dog bite, um, most select boards tend to, if there's a hearing, there's a right to a hearing for the victim, most select boards tend to put conditions. You can, you can own the dog, you've got to take the dog out, only leash and muzzle, you've got to put a fence in your house, under around your house, things like that. Um, but yeah, if you escalate beyond that, you've got authority to at a maximum at the dog put down. So you've got to, if, if there's ever a hearing, you have very broad discretion about what condition you would place ownership of the animal. And if there is an animal that um, is a repeated offender of these kind of things or continuously we're seeing problems from, you know, it's something that I would talk to Tom in the select board about and see how we want to address that and escalate that beyond, you know, face-to-face -face conversations with the owner or any other mitigation strategies that we've tried. And oftentimes there's just people in the community who will step up and say there's a, there's a dog with a bite history living in the village, but I live out by the reservoir and there's no one around me and I've got some land and some practice with this and usually you can find a solution. Okay. Well, that answers my question. Mm -hmm. So who would make the decision about if, if really the dog needed to be put down, who would make that decision? You folks. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it won't come to that. Yeah, that's that's that. Yeah, we're not going to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. it's pretty rare, I think, for it to come to that. Uh, and even then, there's oftentimes no kill shot there that will step up and provide some assistance. Yeah. Most of the time, what I've seen in town, at least, is people who just are uh, not paying attention with their off leash dogs, and their off leash dog runs up to you, and then they just need to come get their dog and put them back on the leash. <laughs> The one unfortunate thing that's not in the ordinance, and I don't believe you can do it, is you can't prohibit ownership. Right. Because I think what you like really take want the dog, and you can't do that. Yeah. Take the dog and so you can't own one again as right. long as you live in our right. You can take that one, but not, not future. Yeah. 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 How would uh, Mike? How would you uh, look at situations where you have dogs that are incessantly barking for <laughs> ex, you know, community members? Mm -hmm. Um, for one, there is also a section of the ordinance that right. defines what excessive barking is. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's different solutions, you know, if it's possible for the dog to be brought in and just, you know, outside for a few periods of time. If there's uh, situations like what is it barking at? Is there something that's aggravating it that can be removed? Um, different ways like that. I 
um, you know, if it is truly like this person just leaves their dog out and it's barking nonstop, then I think that's when, you know, it comes back to the select board for further action and a discussion right. about what to do. But hopefully most of the time people will be amenable if you say, hey, you know, this dog barking is a real issue. Can you limit it? Take the dog inside. Right. Take away the squirrels from the backyard. <laughs> I mean, you like in your letter where you go, you have experience in conflict management because that's what most of these yep. issues are yeah. conflict management. Yeah, I've worked in a lot of uh, customer service or customer service like positions with a lot of different people, and there's a lot of conflict management in that. Yeah. I first thank you. I think we can understate how important this is, and we can talk about it's not so necessary in a small town, but I think it's really important, and I think it takes a really like unique human to do this job because it can go into like either extreme and so i really am i'm so glad you're here um and i think we talk about some realistic situations that obviously happen but are more the exception to the rule what i continue to notice and you may have seen my facebook <laughs> so all over i'm trying to save this dog from getting hit by a car is um dogs that get loose and it's generally just like a door blew open or the gate broke and it's not anything but it i just feel like it's that's one of the most common animal control issues we have and to be frank i don't i don't actually know the solution is it just that citizens then have you to call versus like frantically <coughs> posting on every social media or like what yeah what is the, and i don't expect you to have like the answer because i don't think there is yes. one but like ideas or you know things that you yeah. might have in mind yeah i mean this is something that you see it on from first form all the time and like i just saw one like this afternoon <laughs> um, it does happen a lot um you know part of this is a person to call and pick up the dog tom and i talked about this uh, when we met and um a lot of times people individuals will pick up that dog and then like post on her porch and say hey i have a dog anybody know who this is something like that so it's you know some is reuniting people that the dog is already in a spot there, um, we would need to try and figure out what would happen with, you know, I'm happy to go pick up a dog. I have a dog not like other dogs. And I live in a one bedroom apartment in town. My neighbors don't want me taking the dog and I will be violating dog ordinance. Uh, <laughs> so that would be something that we need to figure out a solution to, like where can a dog be held safely so that, you know, I can go respond quickly, pick up a stray dog, get it to somewhere safe, you know, is there, um, a place that does forwarding or sheltering in town you know, or people who might like sign up and exactly, yeah. take a dog in my backyard and so they run the owner yeah that. yeah well, exactly I think, so, I think in the past you have used some of the maps and stuff terrible. like that yeah, before right. yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and i think that's just something that you know i'll mm -hmm. establish those connections with whoever's appropriate and then make sure that they have a good place for you know the weather the condition the dog would you also have access to the registration <laughs> So this is no, something that we talked about remote access. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If they live on a server that doesn't have a cloud, right? So if they had a name but not a number or something, you couldn't. Well, they have to have on a tag. Well, but I'm so saying, yeah, if they have like a tag that said, you know, over. apple seed, <laughs> you Google it and or not Google it, but could you find it in the registry and call the person or something? Like, well, you know, it's called care. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, can you, can <laughs> you can switch the database by yeah. name. Okay. Um, and there's only 350 dogs in town right now that are licensed. Just under 350. There's probably I'm sure there's more dogs. Easily twice that many dogs. Easy. That's a separate issue. Yeah. yeah, and they have to have their tag on in order for me to help. Right. Okay. Um, a lot of owners are using microchips. Yeah. So and the vet might be able to recognize them if they're yeah. in town or yeah. things like that. Sorry, I didn't mean to really go up here off course. <laughs> I just I'm I'm really excited to hear. There are some glaring things that like like. Loose dogs that were not, you know, yeah. being handled. So thank you. Okay. Any so, other discussion from the board? Just a side note. So this position exists in state law as your appointment, <laughs> just like the planning zoning director. Cool. All right. <laughs> so do I have a motion? I have a motion. I make a motion to approve Ariel Mavia L as the new animal control officer for the town of Warburg. Second. Thank you. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Just curious when the position would begin. I don't think I saw that. I don't yeah, think we talked about it. My yeah. week is busy. But <laughs> <laughs> I think it just began. <laughs> 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 Give me a week. <laughs>
I didn't know if you had to talk about it. And then, uh, we had that. I'm fun. pretty flexible to start whenever, like you said, this week is busy. We have a big group of fundraiser coming yeah. so we love it. We talked about compensation. There's a lot of different models, and every town does different, but essentially it's it's mostly a responsive position. Mm -hmm. uh, there could be some proactive work about some of the yeah, well, like that, but, so it's it's an it's an hourly it's a, it's an hourly rate. Um, but then if there's a response, there's a guaranteed minimum to just for the hassle mm -hmm. not the job with it. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And we abstain. Very good. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I did actually have a, I have a call over the weekend and an email from someone who's lost their dog in Bolton. Oh, okay. Well, Bolton. Bolton. Yeah. yeah, outside of my jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm glad you brought up the situation you did because there has been another incident of a Duxbury dog, or more accurately, a dog that was picked up in Waterbury and brought to Duxbury. So it's not really clear where the dog belonged because no one ever <coughs> took claim to it. But someone was bit and it became this really intertangled mess of who's who is responsible for the dog. Is it a water yeah. dog or a duck? Yeah. Dog? yeah. So those are the dog officer. Yeah, so in that situation then I just worked with yeah. But and I they think have a person now. Listen, I mean so you can think the Annie's right, I think those are Anomalies, they're mm -hmm. not, it's not the norm, but it can happen, so yes. you should be yeah. prepared. Absolutely, Ariel. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Good luck. All right, <laughs> next we have the the appointment of a deputy health officer effective July 1st, 2023. Tom, would you like to address this? Sure, the select board chair uh, by law is the health officer. Um, the deputy health officer has varied at times, but more often than not, it's been a municipal manager. So if Dale is the health officer, is the deputy health officer through June 30th, I'm happy to do it beginning July 1. Um, I'd not be happy to do it in five years. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how happy you are. But it's actually, Really, since in the last going back to November when I started, there's been really one issue related to an apartment. Um, mm -hmm. it comes and goes and spurts. Mm -hmm. You never quite know what the issue is. Um, you know, generally speaking, there's some urgency to them, um, but they're not always Friday night at seven o'clock. You know, my pipes are frozen and I have more sun responsibility, and Twitter are lesser. Um, so I think we can work it out together. There's actually some training to, through through LCT we can attend together okay. um, or through the state. But I'd be glad to help in any capacity, having a lot of experience yeah. mitigating house issues. Yeah. Other questions? So it is the motion to appoint Tom as deputy health officer, effective July 1, 2023, for a term of three years. <coughs> You moving that? Second, yeah. All right. I, I hear a motion and a second. Okay. Any further discussion? Thanks, hi. Hearing none, <laughs> if all of them say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? <laughs> all right. Congratulations, Tom. You are it was a coup for me. I just guaranteed three years of employment. <laughs> that was a question I liked to do. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Next, we have a uh, requesting approval to enter a $250,000 line of credit with Northfield Savings Bank. Yes. Um, so we are changing banks soon. Uh, we've been pretty unhappy with our current bank. I won't say who they are necessarily. But, um, our challenge is we don't have many banks to choose from because we do deposits mm -hmm. mostly every day. So we really need a bank in the house. Um, we're not going to drive down a failure to do the bus. Um, but uh, we selected Northfield. No additional cost to the town would be just better customer service. But as part of the 
part of the turnover, we've got to have the old account open while checks clear. And I just want to make sure that we don't have any issues whatsoever. So I'm requesting a lot of credit that we might not even use at all. Um, so there'd be no interest unless we use it just to have that safety net. So if there's any issue, and part of it is we know what we need to do, but sometimes the other parties, and a great example is the, you know, the state pays us a lot of money during the course of the year and it goes into the current account. It should be a really simple matter to go to the treasurer's office and say, here's our new account number and routing number. But just in case it's not, I want to make sure we've got the liquidity. So cheap insurance, potentially free insurance. And EFA um, at their annual meeting did this verbally. So it wasn't in the town annual meeting. Um, maybe it shouldn't. So what is the interest rate if we do? Uh, I don't have that yet, but I, uh, most short term interest rates, um, and we're talking non gas <coughs> are really short term. So a month or two is percent, somewhere in that range. Yeah. Any further questions? Yes, Mike. Just as a vote of confidence in Northfield, I know uh, I'm a treasurer in a small nonprofit. And they formerly bank in Community National Bank, which is a great bank, don't get me wrong. But I, as I became treasurer, I didn't want to do a lot of the banking in, um, in Montpelier, yeah, which is, is, which is the closest right? branch. Everyone confuses. They say, oh, there's one, that's community bank. Yeah, community banks. They're two, 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 two separate entities. Yeah. But I have been amazed at the level of service and then plus you know we're a small nonprofit they really have bent over backwards to help us and i think the same thing would go for the municipality i think it's a it's a good choice it's a local option you know as we all know there are very few local options and i don't think we want to go out of, out of town to do a lot of our banking it's just very cumbersome so i would be you know very supportive of this and i think the idea that Tom has to do a line of credit, I don't think it's going to be used, but that yeah. just makes sense. Yeah, if we only have for a short time, um, we no interest rate. That's we didn't use it to be no interest. Right. Even if we use right. it for a short time, you know, it might be fifty thousand dollars for a couple of weeks. Gotcha. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, Alyssa. I can move to authorize the municipal manager the authority to open an up to $250,000 line of credit with Northfield Savings Bank um, for use if needed during the transition to the bank. I second that. All right, we have a motion that has been seconded. Any further discussion? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? You are approved for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Thank you. <laughs> employee, employee handbook. This has been introduced to the uh, board in draft form. And the, the changes. Uh, the changes from the last meeting. Kane had suggested short term probation, and that has changed. And Danny gave me um, some gen some some language changes generally related to gender. And those have been incorporated. Um, had a phone call with Roger today, and he had asked if um, I'd incorporated about an employee had, having the right to demand a review. And then that wasn't in my notes, so I didn't do it, but I have no objection. If you want That's to add right that. in there. As I recall from the last meeting, the language is that an employee could demand it, but it was a question more regularly than a year. It was more that we would hope in practice it would support it. Yeah, it does say employees have the right to request from first is why not been conducted within the year. I don't know if you wanted to strengthen that to um I think that's very strong. I agree. And as I said in the last meeting, the, the old policy is several decades old, so if people wanted to take more time. I'm not going to object to a couple more weeks, given where we started. 
We've been talking about this for three years now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's nice to finally have a very formalized employee answer. Right. So I'm going to use John quotation marks. <clears throat> Oh, did I miss quotation marks? <laughs> I thought I got those. And only one more, the town, but only end quote. You got the open quote. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. And I will we don't have to approve that change, but I think you can make that edit whenever you need to. You must have been a proofreader in a former <laughs> job. I, I wish. Anyway. Uh, do I have a motion? I move to <coughs> approve the updated handbook as is from the town of Waterbury. Uh, it's not full. Second. Okay. We have a motion that's uh, been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The employee handbook has been approved. Oh, here. Mm -hmm. Is there a chance I could get a copy of that at home? Want me to email or I can I can give you one. Oh, yeah. Here go. Yeah. Will every employee I assume get a copy? What's his name? I think I assume that. Then. I assume we'll have it on our website when it's yeah. when we get the titles or okay. table of contents, quotation marks. Okay. So will employees be required to sign if they have received just if they received it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's that's a good policy. <laughs> Apologize uh, for being uh, 33 minutes ahead of schedule. <laughs> uh, We're all very angry. Like very angry. I actually just kind of came in late, but I actually have a parking lot item related to, related to the very top of the handbook in the inclusion. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So, so we could still stay on that uh, item. Yeah. I have I have some dates for training with Mary Gannon. Okay. Oh, okay. There's there's an employee piece with I can just schedule. And if a select board member is willing to attend, that'd be, that'd be fine. Um, and then we had talked about a um, couple of different things, but two themes emerged, and we can do either. One is just select board, and there was also the conversation about the select board, but invite other volunteer board members. So we've, we've envisioned um, two evening meetings. Um, she'd like to keep the groups to 30 or less, which I don't think would be an issue for the volunteer boards. And I can, and I've got dates I can throw out, and maybe it's best to start furthest out and kind of head in. Um, and Karen, could you pull the calendar by chip, just the town calendar, so we can see what else might be mm, on the screen or just on my computer? <laughs> either, either on your computer is fine, I think. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. So she's thinking um, two evening sessions, they don't need to necessarily be. You know, Monday or Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, but she's available, and I'll, I'll work backwards from the furthest out July 10th through 12th. Okay, July 10th, this room has a planning commission meeting. <coughs> July 11th, Conservation Commission. July 12th, Edward Prairie Utility District. Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays are going to be the toughest to, to get so, this room. Not that those things can't be rescheduled. <coughs> uh, we have Thursday, June 29th. That one's open. Okay. And is there another one that would be paired with that? Or so we have, one that... we have, we have, I'll keep going. We have Wednesday, June 28th. It's open. Okay. Um, we have Tuesday the 27th. Okay. We have Wednesday, June 14th. And what? <laughs> we have Tuesday, June 13th. Conservation. We have Monday, June 12th. Um, we have Wednesday, June 7th. Oh no. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and we have the fifth, but that's our meeting. Yep. Um, so it sounds like the from the town's schedule perspective, the 27th, 28th, 29th are three good days. I'm sorry, then when were the dates? <laughs> oh, no. Um, 627, 628, 629. Okay, those are all available by mistake. Yeah. Um, 
And then I would likely schedule the employee training those same days since there's some mm -hmm. travel for Marion. Mm -hmm. How about uh, Tuesday, Wednesday? 27, 28. 27, 28. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have, I came direct here, so I don't. Okay. You, oh, so it's open. Oh, you prefer 28, 29? No, I can do that. We'll say, because if no one else has a preference, then. Yeah, I like 28. 28 works best for me. It's too nice. Do you like the Wednesday, Thursday combination? Yeah, the Wednesday, Thursday is great. And Tuesday, Wednesday? That's the week after NQID, right? Yes. Yeah. Wednesday, Thursday. Switch in between and Blackboard. If it's not a problem, it sounds like Wednesday, Thursday are a little bit better for a few people, if that's okay with, that, yeah. with everybody. Mine is like your husband. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, Chris, I wasn't uh, thinking that you were going to talk about this tonight, but it's okay that you are. Um, <clears throat> I was at the initial introduction of this type of thing, the um, fact that I was considered the ultimate room that brought about this <coughs> class. Um, it was suggested that we behind closed doors because it was suggested that there was fear that the public might lash out at certain people because of things that might be said behind closed doors for the safety of board members and people that were attending. <clears throat> but as a, an attendee, at one point during one of the classes, I actually had spoken in favor of wishing it had been open to the public. Mm -hmm. And I think Danny and Mike both know that one of my biggest takeaways from that class, classes, whatever you want to call them, was the fact that as board members, I think we got to know each other on a personal level, which to me was huge. Understand each other a little bit. Uh, if I were still on the board, I have no fear of being open to the public. Simply from a transparency standpoint, uh, and that's kind of, in a sense, it's the takeaway that I took from. Those classes is is the result of me requesting this open house. That's part of what I felt was a positive part of that interaction. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Mike. <clears throat> I do, and as well as Danny, you were part of those sessions. I thought the one good thing by having it a little more in house, I think we were able to be kind of free with you know among each other as to what we wound up saying you know it was something but i do see the other side is i, I always like transparency but there are the two sides is are people not going to be as open in a transparent event as they might be you know it's kind of like you know, if you sit with a therapist, you're going to open up a lot that you probably wouldn't do if you were sitting in, 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 in right here. here. So it's just there are pros and cons. I think that, um, that, yeah, a couple of things, there are a couple of different um, ideas, let's say, at play. So the, this, the facilitation with Mary is geared toward helping community leaders see through a lens of equity and social justice while also confronting systemic and personal biases that exist. So it is not a training for the general public, 
they, they wouldn't be involved in the training because they're not community leaders. So that would mean they were simply audience members. Mm -hmm. That's not, it's really not conducive for this type of in-depth facilitation to have an audience. And to be fair, someone sitting in the audience might want to have something to say and can't. And that's not creating a great atmosphere. Um, I think if we want to show the public what we learn and what we devise from these, I think we did this last year, but it was brief. I wrote like a summary of what we did. It was very high level. It wasn't in depth. We can do that as a select board. We can do that as a staff. We can do that as personal community, private citizens. Um, and we can, you know, talk more in depth. Um, and or perhaps provide a public period at another meeting where folks can ask questions. It doesn't mean you diverge post personal things that you said, but they can say, what kinds of things might you change as a result of this? Or what kind of things have you learned as a leader? And then we can talk to those folks about that experience. Um, but I, I really don't believe that. And I think Mary would say the same thing, but I certainly can't speak to her, but I think she talked about this a little bit is that when it's specifically to train people in a certain position, that's what it's geared for. Um, and the other thing, like thinking about the open house, I'm curious as we have that conversation, like what responsibility and or place does the select board have for that kind of thing? And or where can we find opportunities to partner with community organizations who are meant for building communities, strengthening neighborhood relationships, um, providing <coughs> gathering spaces, et cetera. So rather than necessarily put the impetus on us, how can we talk to those organizations to do what they do best? And then what works for the select board? Is it meet your select board members? Is it just an, a formal and or informal or multiple across the years? So those are the kinds of things on my mind that we'll talk a little bit more deeply about when it's on an agenda. But um, when we think about these things, they don't all have to serve the same purpose and really think about what is the purpose of serving and how do we best do it? Yeah, that was a bit verbose, but um, that's what I have to say. Tom, do you happen to know what if uh, the trainer uh, has a suggestion as to whether this is should be open yeah. or not? Generally, she would say it shouldn't be open mm -hmm. for it, the reasons Danny stated. And plus, if you're extending this beyond the select board, but it's not mandatory for other volunteer board members. You want to get people who, if I think people are reluctant about attending, if it's open to the public, I think they're like they're less likely to attend. Right. You know, so if we're trying to educate, bring about some change, I don't think that's the best way to do it in this case. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I also think if we're opening it, opening it up to say either board members or just or chairs or and to me i think it's really critical that like for instance department heads would be considered to be part of it and i thought at the first meeting that would have been you know like public works director and stuff like that well they're going to do a whole staff training. right so they will all of them including not just the department heads but the whole staff right but that including in the marriage set portion of it that's that's up to you i, I oh. don't right. have any objection to that i assumed i would be there yeah yeah well, but and i would think that we would want as many committee members as we can get right only as 30 uh, could have almost every uh person with survey yeah, and it's more than you think if you've got. Uh, yeah, I was going to say. Was, yes, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Not to counter, but I guess like in the spirit of intentionality and not creating a hierarchy, but I, I was wondering like clearly the library is already pursuing some of those training. So I don't want right. to superimpose on that if mm -hmm. Rachel or others on their board, but I do think about like we have an elected board of library commissioners, we have elected EFUD commissioners, we have us elected, and then we have a whole suite of boards and committees we appoint. And I'm not trying to create an artificial division, but I guess I would want to think about at the next meeting what we think a realistic amount of folks are and just acknowledge that some of those boards and committees have pretty varying levels of uh, time served and things like that, which not that I don't think everyone can benefit from it, but around kind of designing for an audience, I do think there's um, different levels of interaction with the public and things between some of those boards. 
this with the training. You should be more targeted in a certain way. Having not done it, I don't know the whole background. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, my first gap would be yes, invite everyone. I'm just as well, you yeah, said, there's a point of diminishing numbers. returns if you have so many people tell how functionally. Well, she has a cap of thirty, so yeah. So I guess what I'm hearing is uh, that we would have uh, five of us plus Tom. Uh, we get to participate or not. Again, we expect to be welcome. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, my question would be I guess now we have a limit of 30. Um, why wouldn't it be mandatory for appointed boards if we are doing it? Uh, why wouldn't attendance be made like? If you serve on this board, you need to be trained in inclusivity, at least for the you know, people running the boards. Well, yeah, I think that that may be the difference is that uh, the, the chairs that you have them that might make more sense right. than somebody who's like a part time member. Or, right, or, or right. Just, I mean, that, would, that was my question is if you're in a leadership position on one of these appointed bodies. Mm -hmm. I would assume that yeah. attendance would be uh, strongly suggested. And I just acknowledge this is the second time the town will have done it. I wasn't serving on the select board when they did it the first time. So I just personally don't entirely know <coughs> what we're requiring folks to go to. Now I understand it conceptually and support it, but I guess that's why I'm, again, support folks getting the training. Um, but just want to make sure it's appropriate and a good use of their time and recognize that scheduling challenges happen or maybe there's one that could be better suited to the work they're doing um, you know i'm thinking about in particular the bodies i mentioned all recommend budgets so that there's like a specific equity framework around budgets that doesn't doesn't exist in different ways there's like one really specific example and she'll have a deadline for sign up right first so that she would know how many and how to and maybe who to tailor i think um she can tailor it to you know the group versus if there's if we can do more yeah groups have to come back yeah and that's the thing to remember too is like we're not at that we're not anywhere near a finish line of of this type of work so if the first one ever was just the select board and that was an exciting accomplishment and now it's a lot more inclusive and it's not going to be perfect then you may not you know like we just dictated the dates so we're hard pressed to then say like you have to be there because we just chose dates that are convenient for us you know so i think the invitation and even a you know strong encouragement of leadership would be great but as Alyssa mentioned maybe looking at a full list of boards and all those numbers to see how possible it is all right, so the sorry, first, did, sorry, did, sorry, did you find me several on Wednesday the 28th and Thursday the 29th? Okay, that's that's that. okay. Yeah, so the first step will confirm with her for those dates. Uh, do you, uh, does the board want to move forward with inviting uh, committee chairs? Uh, or do you want to put this on the agenda for our next meeting on the 5th? Go ahead, no. Right. no, I was going to say I, I don't see any harm in putting that out now. The suggestion, a mm -hmm. strong, strong, strongly worded suggestion for the committee chairs to uh, attend with us if they can. That's how we would do it. Okay. And then maybe we revisit based on numbers and see about inviting any other members who are interested and available. Okay. But, and then there was some conversation about other town employees. Yeah, uh, department heads. So, what? Uh, I've been talking too much. You take it. It's the same question. <laughs> My question was are they already covered in the employee? Yeah. Or, yes, knowing that we just approved this delightful 30 page document that dictates how Tom interfaces with employees. Personally, I feel like I defer to Tom as being the point of contact for staff and would. <coughs> Encourage him to have staff or training, see training how they see fit. We, you know, support and supervise Tom. So I think it makes sense for him to do a training with us directly. But that yeah. would be my gut, would be that the employees, as long as it happens, uh, Tom figures out the way that it works the best. Yeah. Um, um, I wonder if the department heads might consider it uh, punishment to uh, have to do this twice. Well, I just don't, yeah, well, I don't 
I, I don't understand. It was it just for us to interact with them. Like, why would we have them do it two separate times? I was just asking. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just okay. Make sure I've got the logistics. Sure. I do think, you know, we, we could, as Chris was saying, when there's possibility that you can know, get to know each other more, understand people's concerns, and so forth. But uh, there may be other good opportunities to do that as well. Staff um, board retreat. Woo! Let's go in the wood. Great. And for some reason, I thought you were having a staff one with staff, and then this was separate. Right? Yes. That is yeah, right. I think. Uh, that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, what I'm hearing is uh, the select board, uh, our two uh, reps uh, from the staff, and uh, committee chairs and initially, and then we'll see uh, how it goes from there. Okay, we need to confirm the dates. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. I'm just, it's, it, it would be an invitation. Sorry. Yes, yes, an invitation. I, over them. I strongly encourage us to remember to invite people to the commissioners. I'll buy you to be committee chair. Thank you. Are you doing an outreach then? Yeah. Are we, are we moving for, for this or are we just? Uh, do we uh, need a motion or do you just want consensus? Uh, okay. 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 All right. Well, good way making good use of some of that time. Uh, shall we move on to uh, our next meeting agenda? I have a copy of what I have so far. I apologize. Um, Tom, help me remember. How is your memory? I'm supposed to be doing something. Oh, yeah. I have yeah. on it. <coughs> That's on it. And then, uh, actually, the library is down a person now. Um, Susan Maza resigned, mm -hmm. um, so they're going to need to appoint someone to replace her. So I'm, um, I'm going to, I plan to have that on the next agenda. And planning, uh, mission, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. So going to present uh, to a presentation. Oh, there. Yeah. The goal was hopefully twofold, and that's someone from the planning commission can come and just talk generally about the role and what they're working in, and then also more specifically on the SE group contract around outreach and the bylaw and kind of like the status of that project specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and then also just to name, maybe we also have discussion about a potential planning and zoning director hire, which um, the planning commission has already made a recommendation there, but if there's any follow up, that could also be agendaized. And so you mentioned the SE group. Um, so June 1st, the SE group is going to present the park study to the steering committee. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, SE group will not be presenting that. Steve will be presenting that. Um, it's essentially their meeting to put the final touches on the draft report they'll have. Um, and the SE group will need a little bit of time to incorporate that into a final, depending on how much input they have. Um, that could be an agenda item for the 19th. What's the day of the presentation that you mentioned, Tom? Thursday, June. It's not a presentation. It's on um, the study committee is meeting to look over the direct document. Thursday, June 1st at 6.30. And you would want to put that on the agenda on the 19th or on the 5th? I don't think it's, no, because the SC group's going to need some time to incorporate many comments. The 19th might be aggressive, but I think let's put it as a placeholder. Yeah. Danny and I haven't done it, but we're going to look at the ordinances. Yeah. Sure. But we also didn't say for the 15th, we gave ourselves a little time. I know, that's why we did it. <laughs> Great work. Thanks for putting Are that on the agenda. Anything off the um, park lot for the next meeting? Um, how about an update on the charter? Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was going to say that too. Um, it's something we should be watching. Doesn't need to go on a parking lot or an agenda. Is part of the, I mentioned it to Alyssa when I walked in the door, part of the debt negotiations going on in Washington. They're talking about revoking 
any unspent ARPA funds. So if that goes any farther, <coughs> so we'll spend it. We can we can spend that tonight. <laughs> I, 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 I am not joking. So a valid use of ARPA funds is a provision of government services. And so um, the select board tonight could agree to reimburse the town using ARPA funds for municipal payroll for the course of 2023. And that and, and, and the, the unspent ARPA funds would be gone. Now, the challenge that would create is we have a lot of, we have a million dollars in unspent ARPA funds, most over a million, most of which is allocated. Right. Um, so therein lies the potential dilemma. But the, the unallocated portion, um, we could allocate in this moment. Wow. See, I wasn't expecting. <laughs> now I'm at a loss. But the challenge is, yeah, if they're going to take that money, that, vote. they're going to take challenge. that money that we were hoping to build a bridge with. Mm. Right. That's a challenge. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, I would have that Kane and I can get a housing task force update. Our next meeting, so everyone knows, is this Thursday, the 18th. Um, I will say I had already drafted an agenda, but in light of tonight's discussion, we can modify that to just perhaps include some discussion around homelessness. Okay. Um, and I didn't mention it earlier because I felt public forum was going on a little long, but I would just acknowledge that, like, Barry Montpelier in Berlin had a joint press conference about this. So other municipalities in our region are thinking about this and its impacts. Um, so I think there's, you know, candidly, their press conference was about how they don't feel like there's a lot of solutions, but just to say, we're certainly not the only municipality wrestling with this right now um, in the state level and in central Vermont. Um, so, can add that to my decision. So, Alyssa, did, did you know about like the affordable housing coalition, the changes there? Yes, I met okay. Alyssa. Which is just to say that's a statewide <coughs> coalition that is exploring what their future looks like. Anyone no, wants to participate? It's a challenge with you, where, where they go. Yeah. Um, well, I, didn't know. I don't know if we fully understand the uh, ramifications of uh, allocating all of the remaining funds at this moment. Um, I'm not asking to do it right now. Yeah. Just saying, <laughs> no, I was also just like keeping on our radar as something we should yeah. be paying attention yeah, to. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Kate, but I was going to suggest that if uh, the risk becomes more real, that they are going to uh, take away all our uns unspent ARPA funds. <laughs> And so, could we potentially uh, uh, have a special meeting? Uh, so the, today, I will. I will prepare for the fifth a, a resolution in some detail with dollar amounts. Mm -hmm. We could spend all of our ARPA funds because yep. we are allowed to spend them on a provision of government services. Spend all of our ARPA funds. Um, those funds would essentially move from one pocket to the other, but for ARPA reporting purposes, they're spent, and then we can continue to use them for the projects mm -hmm. we had originally yeah, intended. Yeah, that's what I'm at, yeah. So yeah. I will have that. That makes me sweat a little less. Okay. <laughs> yeah, anything else for the agenda for next meeting on the 5th? No? Okay. Think we're at the end of our regular session. I have a motion to change into a different session. I have um, <laughs> trying to think of the motion offhand, but it's like premature public knowledge with this ah, So I move that. Is it legal or <coughs> there is a vote? Oh, there's a legal issue and an employee issue. Okay, so <laughs> I'll move that premature knowledge of a pending legal issue would clearly place the town of Waterbury at a substantial disadvantage. <laughs> Someone should second that. Second that. Okay. We have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Second. All right. We have a motion that's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? 
Okay, we are now in executive session. Okay, just a second.